Welcome to Networking Rx, a podcast devoted to helping business professionals like you enhance your networking skills in order to become more proficient giving and receiving quality business referrals and improving the overall quality of your life and the lives of those around you. The Networking Rx podcast is a production of AmSpirit Business Connections, an organization whose mission is to empower business success through networking. Welcome back for another episode. This is your host, Frank Egan, founder and president of AmSpirit Business Connections. Before we get started, remember we're looking to add quality people to our stable of franchisees. This is a unique franchise opportunity. It's geared for somebody to add on to what they're already doing. All of our franchisees do something else for a couple hours in the morning, a few mornings a week. They run the AmSpirit Business Connections program, profit from it. The rest of the week, they're working their other business. Their attorneys, their accountants, realtors, coaches, consultants of various kind. If you're interested, contact me. There's my email in the show notes or the one we provide at the end of this podcast. In case you have been living under a rock since 1988, you'll know that the slogan for Nike is just do it. It's actually become a trademark for them. Nike is a shoe company for those who've been living under that rock. The slogan was coined in 1988 at an advertising meeting. The founder of the uh, advertising agency, Whedon and Kennedy, uh, Dan Whedon, credits the inspiration for the Just Do It slogan to Gary Gilmore. To elaborate, Gary Gilmore was a criminal. He was executed in January of 1977 by firing squad, and he was one who was pushing for the death penalty. He wanted to be killed, so just do it. At any rate, Nike's Just Do It Slogan has become iconic. It's part of pulp culture. It's credited for boosting their sales. But beyond the company itself, it's a call to action. It's a call to get busy, get out there, just work out, just do the things you're supposed to be doing. Well, I'm not going to talk about the Nike Just Do It slogan. I'm going to talk about another slogan. I'm going to talk of. I'm going to go back in time about a hundred years. There was another slogan in the early part of the 20th century, actually at the latter part of the 19th century. This all started in 1899. And that slogan was, take a message to Garcia. But for the better part of the first half of the 20th century, the 20th century being the 1900s, 1900 to the year through 1999, for the first part of the 20th century, Take a message to Garcia had real meaning within this country, and I'll share what it what it's all about. At any rate, in 1899, Albert Hubbard published a short essay that inspired and paid homage to taking initiative. How this all came about was Hubbard penned a, an essay called "A Message to Garcia" in an hour after dinner time. Over dinner, he was having a discussion, and at dinner, his son, whose name was Bert, claimed that the true hero of the Spanish-American War was Rowan. Now, who was Rowan? Rowan was Andrew Summers Rowan. He was in the Army, and he was in intelligence within the Army, and, and he was asked by the President of the United States to deliver a message to a general in Cuba. The general was the name Garcia. So you have to understand the time. It's the year 1899, well, actually, the, the war was, was prior to that when he brought the message to Garcia. There was no electricity. There was telegraph, but it, the telegraph was mainly on land. There, there weren't airplanes. There weren't anything. And so when the president of the United States asked Rowan to take a message to Garcia, it was quite a task. So he was credited by Hubbard's son as being messenger who braved death by carrying a note behind the lines to Garcia, the, the leader of the Cuban insurgents. At that point, the, the Spanish uh, had invaded Cuba, um, and at the time, Spain was a real world power. They're a world power now, but they were a real world power, and they were a threat to the United States. And by landing on Cuba and trying to take over Cuba, they were certainly a threat to the American the American way of life, much like we might threat be threatened by the Russians or uh, in the Cold War the Soviets um, so this was a big deal and what the president of the United States wanted to do was he wanted to get message to Garcia saying you have the full support 
of the United States government, but we certainly need your help. We don't know Cuba. We don't know anything about Cuba. Obviously, we don't have satellites. It wasn't. It was a different time. It was a very different time. But you have our support. We just need your help. Help us help you, essentially what he was trying to say. And so when the president asked, and the president at that time was William McKinley, I believe his vice president was actually Teddy Roosevelt. McKinley was ultimately assassinated in office. I don't want this to be a whole history lesson, but there's a whole lot to it. Um, And so McKinley wanted to get this message to Garcia, and he was asking the people around him, you know, how do I get the message to Garcia? And someone said, Rowan. Rowan will get the message to Garcia. So he summoned Rowan, and Rowan got the message to Garcia. And there's a whole book that talks about how Rowan got the message to Garcia, uh, and I won't get into all of that, but it was quite an ordeal to actually get the message to Garcia because Garcia was inland and Rowan had to get to Cuba, which was no small feat. Um, and certainly the Spaniards were keeping an eye on what was coming out of the United States. So it wasn't a direct route from Florida to Cuba. It was going through other Caribbean islands to actually get to Cuba. And then he had to make his way through the jungles of Cuba. Cuba is no small country from the beaches of Cuba to find Garcia getting through spies, Cuban spies uh, who were siding with the Spaniards um, and getting through the Spanish. Anyhow, it was, a, it was a big ordeal. He was able to get through, talk to Garcia, get the message to Garcia. You have our support. And actually what Garcia ended up doing was saying, not only we will give you intelligence, but I'm going to send people back with you who can meet with your people. Big reason why the United States won the uh Spanish-American War. And the Spanish-American War was kind of a war between the Civil War and the First World War that's somewhat forgotten, um, but it was a war. So with that backdrop, Hubbard's sitting around the table at dinner talking with his son, and his son claimed that the true hero of the Spanish-American War was Rowan, a messenger who braved death by carrying this note to General Garcia, who was leader of the Cuban insurgents. Um, And so After dinner, what Hubbard did, Hubbard ran a magazine. He ran a small magazine called The Philistine. And what he did after dinner was that he wrote an an article, just a short little, it wasn't very long. um, But he published it in the February 1899 issue of The Philistine. And now again, this was something that was published. It was back in, it was a different time. It wasn't emailed. It wasn't online. Um, even mailing it out, there weren't huge, weren't huge list, but uh, he published it, and he didn't. He, the, the Philistine had lots of different things, and this, this a message to Garcia was just a small part of this whole, this whole uh, magazine. At any rate, he published it, and he sent it out to his distribution, and and someone read it. Actually, lots of people read it. I think he had a distribution of about five thousand. But someone of significance read it, and this someone of significance was a gentleman by the name of George Daniels, and he was with the New York Central Railroad. And Daniels then asked for for permission to reprint and distribute 500,000 copies of this. Just the one article, just the the A Message to Garcia article, because it was was so inspiring and inspired inspired people. Um, And actually, if you read the backstory of look into this, Hubbard had to reach out to Daniels and say, listen, I have no way of getting to you 500,000 of these. Um, It would take me months to do this. Tell you what, I'll give you the right to do it. And then the New York uh, Railroad did it. And obviously at that time, the railroads were huge. So anyhow, 500,000 copies go out to the railroad and there happened to be someone on the railroad who picked up a copy and it was the director of the Russian Railways and read one of these reprints and then had it translated into... Russian, and then he distributed a message to Garcia to every one of his railroad employees. Then the Russian military picked up on it, and they took the essay, and they made sure that every Russian soldier sent to the Japanese front had a copy. And then uh, in this in this war between Russia and Japan, and I don't know enough about that history, and I'm not going to get into it here, but they took prisoners of war And the Japanese military found the essay in in possession of some of these Russian prisoners. And so out of curiosity, because all these prisoners had it, out of curiosity, they had it translated into Japanese. And they were so moved by it that the emperor ensured that each member of the Japanese government had a copy. 
and certainly then people in the Japanese Navy and Army also had it. And then it came full circle because the United States Navy got a copy of it from the Japanese, and then they distributed it to every officer and every sailor at the brink of the First World War. Needless to say, this short essay that was just penned after dinner became very popular. A message to Garcia was very popular. They estimated that it sold more than 40 million copies and was translated into dozens of languages. It became a well-known quotation for American business culture until the middle of the 20th century, as I said. To take a message to Garcia was slang for taking initiative. Now, before I jump into what this has to do with networking, and it does, I wanted to share with you a message to Garcia. This is a narration of the original essay by Albert Hubbard, and this is done by Daniel Gianna Scoli, who is a New York-based actor and narrator, and this is from his 2015 recording. He's allowing us to use it here with his permission, and he does a great job. I tried to do it myself, and it was a mess, and that's when I reached out to, to Daniel. If you need his voiceover services, you can contact him for your next commercial, industrial, or educational media project. Contact him through his website, giannascoli.com, and I'm going to put this in the show notes, but I'll spell it here. It's G-I-A. N-N-A-S-C-O-L-I dot com. So I'm going to play it. It's a little long. He does a great job in capturing the essence of a message to Garcia. And when it's done, we'll do a quick recap as to how this interplays to networking. A Message to Garcia by Albert Hubbard. Narrated by Daniel Giannascoli. In all this Cuban business, there is one man stands out on the horizon of my memory like Mars at Perihelion. When war broke out between Spain and the United States, it was very necessary to communicate quickly with the leader of the insurgents. Garcia was somewhere in the mountain fastnesses of Cuba. No one knew where. No mail or telegraph could reach him. The president must secure his cooperation, and quickly. What to do? Someone said to the president, There's a fellow by the name of Rowan will find Garcia for you, if anybody can. Rowan was sent for, and given a letter to be delivered to Garcia. How the fellow by the name of Rowan took the letter, sealed it up in an oilskin pouch, strapped it over his heart, in four days landed by night off the coast of Cuba from an open boat, disappeared into the jungle, and in three weeks came out on the other side of the island, having traversed a hostile country on foot, and having delivered his letter to Garcia, are things... I have no special desire now to tell and tell. The point I wish to make is this. McKinley gave Rowan a letter to be delivered to Garcia. Rowan took the letter and did not ask, Where's he at? By the Eternal! There is a man whose form should be cast in deathless bronze and the statue placed in every college in the land. It is not book learning young men need, nor instruction about this or that, but a stiffening of the vertebrae which will cause them to be loyal to a trust, to act promptly, concentrate their energies, do the thing, carry a message to Garcia. General Garcia is dead now, but there are other Garcias. No man who has endeavored to carry out an enterprise where many hands were needed, but has been well nigh appalled at times by the imbecility of the average man, the inability or unwillingness to concentrate on a thing and do it. Slipshod assistance, foolish inattention, dowdy indifference, and half-hearted work seem the rule. And no man succeeds unless, by hook or crook or threat, he forces or bribes other men to assist him. Or, mayhap, God in his goodness performs a miracle and sends him an angel of light for an assistant. You, reader, put this matter to a test. You are sitting now in your office. Six clerks are within your call. Summon any one and make this request. Please look in the encyclopedia and make a brief memorandum for me concerning the life of Correggio. Will the clerk quietly say, Yes, sir, and go do the task? On your life, he will not. He will look at you out of a fishy eye and ask one or more of the following questions. Who was he? Which encyclopedia? Where is the encyclopedia? Was I hired for that? Don't you mean Bismarck? What's the matter with Charlie doing it? Is he dead? Is there any hurry? Shan't I bring you the book and let you look it up yourself? 
What do you want to know for? And I will lay you ten to one that after you have answered the questions and explained how to find the information and why you want it, the clerk will go off and get one of the other clerks to help him find Garcia and then come back and tell you there is no such man. Of course, I may lose my bet, but according to the law of average, I will not. Now, if you are wise, you will not bother to explain to your assistant that Correggio is indexed under the C's, not in the K's. But you will smile sweetly and say, never mind, and go look it up yourself. And this incapacity for independent action, this moral stupidity, this infirmity of the will, this unwillingness to cheerfully catch hold and lift, are the things that put pure socialism so far into the future. If men will not act for themselves, what will they do when the benefit of their effort is for all? The first mate with knotted club seems necessary, and the dread of getting the bounce Saturday night holds many a worker in his place. Advertise for a stenographer, and nine times out of ten who apply can neither spell nor punctuate, and do not think it necessary to. Can such a one write a letter to Garcia? You see that bookkeeper, said the foreman to me in a large factory. Yes, what about him? Well, he's a fine accountant, but if I send him to town on an errand, he might accomplish the errand all right, and, on the other hand, might stop at four saloons on the way, and when he got to Main Street, would forget what he had been sent for. Can such a man be entrusted to carry a message to Garcia? We have recently been hearing much maudlin sympathy expressed for the downtrodden denizen of the sweatshop, and the homeless wanderer searching for honest employment. And with it all, often go many hard words for the men in power. Nothing is said about the employer who grows old before his time in a vain attempt to get frowsy ne'er-do-wells to do intelligent work, and his long patient striving with help that does nothing but loaf when his back is turned. In every store and factory, there is a constant weeding-out process going on. The employer is constantly sending away help that have shown their incapacity to further the interests of the business, and others are being taken on. No matter how good times are, this sorting continues. Only if times are hard and work is scarce, this sorting is done finer. But out and forever out, the incompetent and unworthy go. It is the survival of the fittest. Self-interest prompts every employer to keep the best, those who can carry a message to Garcia. I know one man of really brilliant parts, who has not the ability to manage a business of his own, and yet who is absolutely worthless to anyone else because he carries with him constantly the insane suspicion that his employer is oppressing or intending to oppress him. He cannot give orders and he will not receive them. Should a message be given him to take to Garcia, his answer would probably be, take it yourself. Tonight this man walks the street looking for work. The wind whistling through his threadbare coat. No one who knows him dare employ him, for he is a regular firebrand of discontent. He is impervious to reason, and the only thing that can impress him is the toe of a thick-soled number nine boot. Of course I know that one so morally deformed is no less to be pitied than a physical cripple, but in your pitying... Let us drop a tear, too, for the men who are striving to carry on a great enterprise, whose working hours are not limited by the whistle, whose hair is fast turning white through the struggle to hold the line in dowdy indifference, slipshod imbecility, and the heartless ingratitude which, but for their enterprise, would be both hungry and homeless. Have I put the matter too strongly? Possibly I have, but when all the world has gone a-slumming, I wish to speak a word of sympathy for the man who succeeds, the man who, against great odds, has directed the efforts of others, and having succeeded, finds there's nothing in it, nothing but bare board and clothes. I have carried a dinner pail and worked for a day's wages, and I have also been an employer of labor, and I know there is something to be said on both sides. There is no excellence, per se, in poverty. Rags are no recommendation. And all employers are not rapacious and high-handed any more than all poor men are virtuous. My heart goes out to the man who does his work when the boss is away as well as when he is home. And the man who, when given a letter for Garcia, quietly takes the missive 
without asking any idiotic questions, and with no lurking intention of chucking it into the nearest sewer, or of doing aught else but deliver it, never gets laid off, nor has to go on strike for higher wages. Civilization is one long, anxious search for just such individuals. Anything such a man asks will be granted. His kind is so rare that no employer can afford to let him go. He is wanted in every city, town, and village, in every office, shop, store, and factory. The world cries out for such. He is needed, and needed badly. The man who can carry a message to Garcia. This concludes a message to Garcia by Albert Hubbard. Production copyright 2015 by Daniel Giannascoli. All rights reserved. What a great job that is. I could listen to that over and over and over again. Mind you, 40 million people read that at the turn of the 20th century. 40 million people worldwide. Talk about something going viral. But that's neither here nor there. The real lesson behind this, behind a message to Garcia and its implication to networking is simply this. In networking, you build relationships by developing know, like, and trust amongst the people that you interact with. And we talk about this, I talk about this time and again. It's fundamental to networking. And the key component of know, like, and trust is the trust component. And so what I'm driving at when I talk about take a message to Garcia is, is that we need to be that reliable. We need to have that kind of initiative behind the things that we pledge we're going to do. If we commit to somebody that we're going to do X, whatever it might be, send them an article, get them a book, make an introduction, we need to take a message to Garcia. If we see a way that we can help somebody else, we need to take it upon ourselves to take a message to Garcia, to see it through, to have the initiative. There might be all sorts of things that are falling in our way and, and make it difficult, but we need to see it through. That's the lesson in Take a Message to Garcia, is that we need to have that level of reliability, that level of initiative, that when we commit to things, nothing will stand in our way. That when we serve the people in our network, that we need to continually take a message to Garcia. Thanks for joining us on the Networking Rx podcast. Please put what you've learned into action today and let us know if you have questions, comments, or ideas for future topics. You can email them to us at podcast at amspirit.com. That's A-M-S-P-I-R-I-T dot com. Finally, so you never miss an episode, be sure to subscribe to the Networking Rx podcast through iTunes, Overcast, or however you receive your podcasts. Now get out and network with someone. The Networking Rx podcast is a copyright production of Amspirit Business Connection. All rights reserved.